Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Arapo uh, Aida Mia. Uh, from Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. It's um, probably easier to remember. It's called KTH. It's easier. Uh, I, I used to know the former director of the lab a uh, long time ago. So he now retired. Yes. Yeah. He's, he still from. comes. But oh, still comes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Alp uh, has uh, done uh, quite a lot of work related to Kinect. He's an uh, uh, enthusiast of Kinect sensors, he bought uh, probably 20, 30 Kinects and distribute to other people, try to collect data, etc. So he has a lot of uh, experience in using Kinect and also uh, a number of interesting projects uh, he has been doing and uh, he's finishing his PhD. Mm -hmm. So, Alpha, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, for having me. So. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, two projects, two and a half projects actually, uh, that spawned after uh, um, when I was working on this robot that is supposed to find objects in the real world. So the scenario with this, with this robot was that you turn it on, it doesn't know where it is, and you ask the robot to find an object wherever it is. So it doesn't have a map, it has the models of the objects that it's trying to find and so on. So then it needed to, what should the robot do at this point? So this is, an, this is a previous, previous work that, that we did. And the, the robot starts by exploring and then it spots, oh, sorry. The, uh, and then it spots a, a door to its left but while exploring. So now the robot, we ask the robot to find a complex box object, by the way. So, and then it, it, it continues exploring and all the while it's doing planning at each step and so on. And, uh, and then it enters this room, and then it's doing place categorization, and then it realizes that this is actually an office room, and complex boxes are not usually found in office rooms, especially according to its prior knowledge in this case. So then it decides to go out and explore some more about the, in the world, and then it goes on some more, and then it takes to the next. So at this point, the robot makes trade-offs, like should I explore here or should I go into this room, more in the corridor and so on. And then it en enters the, the kitchen. It doesn't know yet this is a kitchen, but now it, it, after taking some more images and laser scans, it realizes that this is actually a kitchen and then it starts searching in this, in this uh, room. So if you were to, for example, close the kitchen door, if it couldn't find the kitchen, it would start continue exploring, entering rooms, oh, this is an office as well and so on. And at some point it would give up. So this is like a flexible way of uh, uh, finding objects in, in large un unexplored environments, which, wasn't, which was constrained to much smaller environments before. So from this system, I've uh, encountered two problems, two main problems. One was that this reasoning about unexplored space. How does the robot knew that, for example, there's only one kitchen in floors, or there is a corridors leads to more rooms and so on. So how, how did the robot know? And in the literature as well, and in this robot as well, this was hard coded. So we, we sort of put in numbers there to, to, to make the robot do these things or to bias the planner towards that. And the other, so, so this was a problem that, 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 I, that I'm going to explain. Uh, this is one of the projects. So the other uh, problem was that finding objects in scenes. This was a, a really challenging task for the objects that we were looking for, for example, like cups and small objects, those kind of office type objects. And, uh, and the robot was basically coming up with lots of uh, false positives and so on. So I'm going to first talk about that part, the, the Kinect work, because I sort of switch which project to say first according to where I talk about this. Um, so the title of this bit is Exploiting and Modeling Local 3D Structure for Predicting Object Locations. So let's, let's look at this picture. And this is, a, this is a frame of when the robot entered the kitchen. So this is like a typical household uh, place environment. And we are looking for here for a cup. And this is a Kinect image, by the way. Um, 
And here we can, we, we can see that what happened also that uh, it's really, really hard to see these cups here or detect these. Uh, so if you can, of course, play with, this, uh, with the tuner of your algorithm, but depending on where you put the slider, you will, you, what we came up with usually is that we had lots of false positives all around the place uh, or no, no good detections uh, and so on. And, uh, and then I thought about this, how can we fix this? And uh, one thing what I thought is that we are taking all these uh, Kinect frames in, into the robot at 30 frames per, per second in order to not to bump into things, in order to do obstacle avoidance and so on. And then we were sort of throwing away that depth data and doing sliding window on the whole image for, uh, for uh, detecting objects. So I thought we could use the, we should, we should probably make use of this 3D uh, data. And the, the previous work did this by, in, uh, by basically extracting planar surfaces, flat horizontal planar surfaces. And the assumption was there that the objects are on tables, basically, that was it. So everyone pretty much extracted flat surfaces that corresponded to, or sometimes not, to tables, and then looked on, on the areas of those, where, looked at the image where there's this tabletop scenario. And uh, this doesn't scale well for uh, lots of object classes. And we, every time you come up with a new object class, you uh, need to uh, code in spatial routines just for this. So now, for example, uh, plain uh, horizontal surface detector and then some ca other kind of vertical surface detector, or you need to really uh, tune a lot your uh, 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 plane detector and so on. So I didn't want to do that. And, um, and uh, the argument of this work, the claim, is that object placement in scenes is, is highly correlated, strongly correlated with the local 3D structure around the object. So intuitively what this means is that if you look at objects and if you look at their surroundings in depth, and you can learn a model of how that looks like, their, their context, if you will, that will give a lot of cues on if, if that class of object will be in this part of the region seen or not. So we call this the 3D context of an object. So this gives you like a contextual cue where an object class of O might be given a scene. Um, and um, so here's the same image and here's uh, the output from, uh, from the algorithm or the method that I'm going to explain. So for cups, for example, the bright areas are where the, this is a bit, looks a bit darker than how it is in my screen, but the, the, the algorithm comes up with these places where a cup might be at. And, and, you, and this makes sense quite a lot because there's no way there will be a cup on, on, the, on the wall, just on the curtain, for example, or, or on the back of a chair or, or, or around these areas. So, um, and so there's no reason actually to look at those areas and come up with lots of false positives and so on. We can sort of make use of this um, 3D information. So what should we, if we now step back a bit and think, what should we, uh, what should we be careful when designing, when coming up with something like this? So, so couple, like for some object classes, uh, certain objects may appear to be in different contexts. Take, for example, here the, the whiteboard marker here. So this, this in, in depth images, depth connect frames, this might appear to be on flat horizontal surfaces, but it might very well appear to be on, on walls as well. It just looks like, like it's, it's attached to a wall. So what this means is that the method that we came up with should should uh, be uh, sufficient enough to uh, model this multimodal context. So you have this multi multiple modalities in your uh, 3D data um, where the same object appears in very different places, uh, but not, not uh, completely random. Um, the other one is that uh, certain regions of the image may predict with high probability the, 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 the presence of an object at another region. So, for example, one part of the image here, the sink here, might say that whenever you see something like this, there's a very high probability that there will be a water tap here. And those are disjoint regions. So, the method also should capture, capture that. Uh, the fact that uh, there's one part of the region of the image 
that is saying that look over there, there will be an object over there. Um, so, um, yeah. So, um, so how do we model this then, this model, uh, 3D context? Uh, so we want to basically find uh, probability uh, how likely for an object class O to be at location X, Y, Z, given a, a, like a scene, a 3D scene. And we call this, uh, this function P here. P, X, given the scene and the object. And in this work, I mod I've chosen to model the P as a set of weak classifiers S, that each, each, each weak classifier here uh, explains part of the context, part of this uh, 3D context. So that allows you to have this multimodality. When, you, when later you combine uh, these weak set of weak classifiers to, to make one strong classifier. Um, so, and I do that by uh, gradient boosting. So this is like an overall, overall view of, of, the, of the, uh, how this is modeled. And um, so what does each weak classifier actually model? So here we have uh, this, the, the red region here, that is uh, RF, is where we extract a feature response. And then you can see that uh, there's also this blue region, which is tied to the red region, red, red rectangle with, a, with an offset, fixed offset. Right? And this is where we compute a objectness measure. This, is, th this measure is the amount of the overlap between the blue region and the, and the object's annotation. So this tells you basically how much of the object is there in the, in the blue region. And, but then this tells you is that it's a goodness measure for uh, the, the region here the, where we extract the feature response and the offset value. So then you can say that, okay, whenever you see something like the sink here, like a depression, uh, there will be an object at this part. And um, so by changing the size of these regions and the offset, you can have uh, lots of uh, different weak classifiers. So the, each weak classifier is parameterized by the size of this region and the offset. And then what we do is that we learn uh, a regression model from a feature uh, from F uh, here, a feature to the 1D measure L. So that's like a, from multiple dimensions to one dimension. And as feature, we, I've chosen to use histogram of surface normals uh, uh, divided at each x, y, z, eight bins. So it's like a 512 uh, dimensional vector. And the reason for that is that you don't actually want to have a very detailed feature at this point because you, you want to sort of capture the rough idea about the context. You don't want to actually uh, capture the, the exactly the, how it looks like. Um, so for, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, sort of giving you an overview. For evaluation purposes, I've, uh, we've collected data from five different sites. In, in Europe. So these are at KTH, University of Vienna, DFKI, German Center for Inte Artificial Intelligence, University of Birmingham, University of Ljubljana. And what I did is that I, at some point I uh, flew down to Vienna with six Kinects in my luggage and gave, handed uh, one to everyone and mounted on their robots and told them to, when you go back, capture where your work environment and send that data to me. Uh, and that amounted some amount of RGBD scenes of real world uh, offices. And I annotated that for five objects that has quite different contexts. So that's the, the reason why cho for choosing these exact object classes because they had quite different contexts. Cups are on, on tables, so that takes care of all the laptops and keyboards and all that sort of stuff. And then whiteboard marker, as I said, that can be on, appear to be on a wall, but also on a table. Trash cans are on the floor, wall plugs are on the walls, but not the, sort of at the floor height, and so on. Uh, and in total, uh, the, we have annotated that for some amount of images. So first I'm going to give you like a, yeah. yeah. How many different rooms? How many different rooms? Yeah. Uh, so in each of the uh, recordings, there were at least uh, four type of rooms, but um, it's, <laughs> Shots, right? Yes, yes. So this is a sequence of objects. So, yeah, yeah. so how many different rooms? Yeah. That's a, that's a in total, I have 
approximately between 15 rooms, I would say, yes. Uh -huh. And so the, the, here, the, it's actually a video of Kinect images. So, yeah. um, so first, I, I will just give a qualitative, uh, like what does the robot, what does the method comes up with? So here is a scene, uh, and the object here is the whiteboard pen. And this is the this is the output from the from the algorithm. Where the, basically the method says that if you are if you are in this scene and if you are looking for a whiteboard pen, it's either on the table or it's on a wall, but at a certain height. Because and that's also another thing we know the height because we we know where we mounted this on the robot. So that's like an embodied system. We know the exact x y z. So th this is what the method comes up with. And then you don't have to actually. Um, search over the whole image. That, that, that's the point. Yeah. You mentioned uh, you have combined RGB and depth. So is your classifier... This is only depth. Only, only yes, depth. The, the RGB is for visualization, basically, okay. so, so that you see... So you're only basing your classifier on depth. Exactly. So this is without using any visual cues, just the 3D context, just the structure. Um, yeah, so th that's one. And so this is uh, another scene, and where... Yeah. I think it's below. So what the, on the on the flip chart? In flip chart. Oh, here. So there's a marker there. You yes, know, here. Money. Yep. It's outside the region where you show. Um, yes, definitely. It is outside. It's uh, it's true. So that's not like, for example, there is another marker here. It's not really in view. There's a, there are some others here. Those are in, but uh, not this one, for example. That's, that's true. But the, the, the thing here is that uh, um, since this is running on a robot and so on, it's a mobile system. One of the considerations here is that if you were to run your, that detector on this image, maybe you wouldn't get any detections at all. You wouldn't get. So with this, the idea is that we could look here, and then the robot might travel here and make a closer, take a closer look here, so for far away regions. Uh, basically, or take a use it use it higher resolution camera to to uh, zoom into these areas. Basically, so that that's the the point. So the the exactly, that I forgot to say that. So the, the exactly. So around the edge of the table, you don't consider the uh, No, it's less and less. So that was one of the artifacts of uh, uh, the more sort of you are in the middle of the table because it's more looks more flat whereas here it's it's you are at the edge so the intensity drops so this is uh, for the trash can object the result for the so what this basically says is that the trash can here is on the floor but it's more so on the edges of the wall it's not just in the middle of the floor and it's never like on a wall here, or on the on the table here, or on the person here. So that's uh, what a normal object detector would do. And you, uh, yeah, um, this is the same for uh, water tap. So this is like actually a very cluttered scene. Yeah. For the, for the trash can, mm -hmm. the trash can itself is going to show up in the depth. It's yes. Large enough that's going to. So is this? But that's not used. Though. Sometimes, for example, this. Uh, is, was very reflective. The, the, it had this plastic thing, and uh, Kinect didn't pick up on that. That was completely. That uh, also happens with this scene. Uh, the metallic uh, objects, such as this, they completely are missed in in Kinect images. And one of the interesting things from here is that uh, even though you don't see it in depth, the surroundings of it might indicate that there would be something there. Uh, so even though it's, it misses in the image, you can say that, well, uh, it misses in the image, but there, um, there will be a water tap here because this looks like a sink, for example. And the method learns this by not hard coding or uh, coding a sink detector, like a table detector and so on, but it's, it's the same method. You just uh, give a set of annotated images to it, and it, it learns that. So this is the result for uh, for the water tap. You can see here. You can see that there is uh, it gets confused as well here. So this is also bright, and these regions are somewhat uh, more brighter than what they should be. But uh, it's it's quite uh, cluttered scenes like that. Uh, 
Um, so I'm going to an, another example for wall plug. Uh, another example for wall plug. What, what this says basically is that you don't have a wall plug when you have a table or uh, something very rugged looking, like a box and some things and so on. Um, yeah, so I'm going to another one. This is a much less structured scene where you only have basically walls. Uh, and what the method says is that, well, if that happens, it's, it's probably a wall plug is at, at this height or at the shoulder height. And that depends on the training data, of course. That's, that's the type of wall plugs that we had in, in the training set. But why not on the other wall? Uh, it looks, so here, <laughs> you can see it here. It, this is actually uh, also uh, bright, but um, the thing is that here, this gets completely destroyed by these uh, uh, structures here. Um, and uh, why not on this other wall? That's a, that's a good question. The, um, it, it's not completely missing, so it is, uh, there's certainly some intensity there, uh, but uh, my guess would be that uh, this part of the scene is quite, it's far away from the camera than, uh, than these parts. And that would, uh, that in Kinect, if, I don't know if you looked at it, but if, if the points are far away, you have this lots of uh, variations in the, so a flat fall wall doesn't appear as flat anymore. So you have this uh, rugged, surface when it's uh, far away and that might be dis disturbing it that might be because it's probably that here at this moment uh, the, the model learned says that wall plugs are on flat vertical surfaces and that might not be as, as vertical I can I can check more into that but the, sort of these examples contains cases where it works and where it doesn't do so well and now some quantitative evaluation. I will only show one, uh, like example, one graph, but I have more, but uh, just to keep it in time. Uh, so what this graph tells you is that given uh, that we throw away, for example, half of the image, the least promising half of the image, how much of the object we still have uh, in the predicted, predicted regions. So if we, if we cut down uh, one third of the image or half of the image or so and then we retain we look at the object annotation the overlap of the object annotation and the regions that left to us how much is that and here we can see that as an example here one is cup uh, in general you can get rid of half of the image and still you get almost all of the cups all of the actual cups so and, uh, and the performance drops for bigger objects such as, uh, or more complicated objects such as water tap and, uh, and the trash can here. But um, in general, you can pretty much get rid of one third of the object, uh, one third of the uh, image. So the point would be, is that um, what I'm also working on right now is to make a camera rig where you have several connects and a high resolution camera and point your detection algorithm where this method says there will be an object there. So then you can afford to run this expensive object detection algorithms. If you could get like a high resolution image of that tabletop that you saw in the first image, if you, if you could do that, if, say that you have like an eight megapixel image and not a connect image. So that's, that's the point. So this is the first uh, project in, in a, uh, uh, explained in a rather fast way. Uh, but the conclusion here is that we have all this 3D data uh, coming in for, and we are using it already for various purposes. So we should be able to make use of that also when looking for objects, uh, not just features on the object itself, because that might be even invisible at, uh, in a lot of scenes, but uh, make use of the whole scene basically. So depending on how the whole scene looks like, we should be able to, um, and we can. Um, <clears throat> and this is, this is uh, the, the idea, 3D context idea is, is we introduced here, and this is one way of modeling it, but you can think of other ways. So, yeah. In terms of the data set, do you, do you label the objects? Yes, uh, I, there are 2,200 uh, annotations 
in there. But do you only label the five? The yes, the, just the five. Okay, you didn't label the other ones, like the chairs. No, 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 no. So that's another, exactly. So that, that's another contextual cue that you can use. So if there's a chair here, there will be a monitor here and so on. But those are uh, more high level cues. So you need to actually, you are assuming there that you can actually detect chairs and then use that to detect monitors or keyboards and things like that. Whereas this is completely from low level. So this is <coughs> from features, basically, um, low level features. Uh, but that's, uh, there are, I'm aware of the works by, for example, Toralba uh, in that. So this uh, say that you detected already five, four objects and you are trying to guess what could be. Yeah, object, object co-occurrence is what I said. OK. Quick Uh, no, but we know the height, which is pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So yes, we know sort of the uh, the z. Mm -hmm. So that's that's important when you, for example, the volpugs are at the shoulder height or or so. On. Yes. Mm -hmm. How since you're using this motivation to reducing the search space, mm -hmm. how complex? Exactly. I didn't include those parts, to, but I have the slides actually. Um, so the, the algorithm takes nearly uh, between 600 milliseconds to 1.7 seconds to run. And the, the, the object detector that I was using at the time um, well, is a Falcon Wipes uh, detector. That took um, approximately 20 seconds to run on a VGA image. Uh, on a relatively fast computer. So, and that's prohibitively slow for robotics applications where you want to just move in and take pictures and or you are, when you are, there's this incoming stream of images, you can't just process them 20 seconds uh, a time. So that was, and it came up with lots of false positives and so on, that was problems when the objects are small or textureless or the scene is far away. So then the, then I had this idea of, okay, let's make use of the 3D structure that we have already coming from the Kinect at 30 frames per second. Let's, let's not just throw it away. Um, because typically one of the problems with search is that you have to search the objects and you don't know the scale. Mm -hmm. But just combining the depth with the scale, mm -hmm. you would reduce the search space. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. um, I agree, I totally agree with that. So you could say that, so this patch of the image, for example, is three meters away from me. So I know that a cup object will only have, will only look in five by five pixels or, or something. So you can directly go in, in your detector that uh, part of the detector that gives responses for that scale, right? Yes, that, that's, that's actually true. Um, there are, I've seen some works that does this, like initial works in, in, in a workshop um, that makes use of Kinect uh, and the scale of the Kinect to bias an object detector in this sense. Um, that's also quite possible. But one of the things is that also uh, with this type of thing, you can also think that um, where, where would I put an object in the scene, for example? Like where would I place an object? in the scene. So that's, with the, if, if you are go only going from the object detector, you still have this case of missed detections and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, guess, I guess my point is that I like the idea of using context to improve regulation. I just think using that just to find where to look and then throwing away the depth information seems... Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. No, uh, here uh, that the, that second part is is not there. So it's it's not that we are throwing that away. So this is mostly focused on where to look, where to like uh, direct your object detectors. But once, uh, as I said, one of the things that I, I'm trying right now is to make this uh, rig where uh, there are high resolution cameras coupled with a Kinect camera and calibrated so that you know when, for example, the algorithm says here will be cups you can get a high resolution image of just that region. Um, so that's also something more in line of what, what you were uh, 
proposing, I guess. So a question here. How would you classify object in different depths? Would you have like a classifier which is parameterized on the depth, or would you like maybe take two or three classifiers on different different depths? Or would you think you make a model, maybe you want to see an object at 50 centimeters, a meter, a meter and a half, and then create multiple classifiers for those? Yes, so I, I guess that, that's why he was referring to. Mm -hmm. I guess either one would work. I would prefer to include the depth information. Yeah. On the classifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was already at that point thinking, okay, now how do I run my classifiers? Like, I don't know of any classifier which can be parameterized based on depth. So it's probably I mean, the taking way, multiple snapshots. Like, an easy way of doing that is you just, like, you, you use the scale information. So you basically say, oh, I am encoding it at, like, a pixel, say, like, whatever, one meter, what you need it to be. So you can, you can make a classifier use the absolute values for size because now since depth will give you the actual size so you just like write your classifier based on oh my classifier is going to take anything which is one meter by one meter and uh, so the, the simplest sort of most straightforward way of doing it is that training a classifier at e for each scale basically you don't need to and that's what they do pretty much so but th that's what I'm saying. You don't need to do that because if you know the absolute, if you know the, uh, the value in absolute terms, you don't need to uh, train it at relative things because when you know the depth, you can sure, sure. translate. Sure, But the, I mean, people do this in more clever ways. They don't just train 5,000 uh, classifiers. But uh, in 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 those uh, classifiers, that's what you do in this. Uh, Cascaded classifiers, for example, where you blur the image at in the in the scale space more and more and more to have this effect of getting more and more away from the from the scene, and then you you train classifiers at each each of these uh, scales. Uh, that's what, for example, SIFT is doing at multiple levels. Um, uh, and the, the work that I've uh, mentioned was using this the property that in SIFT. Um, uh, this cascaded uh, responses from the from an image region. They were directly going into that scale and picking those features. Okay. But uh, yeah, it, it can be done. It should be investigated more, I guess. Um, so, so I have another question. Yeah. Uh, so the three D depth map from the Kinect mm -hmm. has different reliability and accuracy depending on the depths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the zigzag when it's further away. Have you used incorporated the uncertainty of the measurement in your 3D contact training? No, not not here. Yeah, no. Um, and that that uh, comes up with some problems. As I in the for example in this in the response image of this, you saw some uh, high response here as well. And that the reason for that was that this bit is is some reflective material that just makes weird depth values there. So then the but. Yeah, so some smoothing and those things would be useful, I think, when you get. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so the next next uh, project that came from this logically followed this. So as I said, I've uh, at some point in order to collect lots of data for this work and make a fair evaluation, uh, I, I gave connects to lots of people and asked them collect them gigabytes of data and, and upload to my FTP servers and so on. And they did that because they were kind of colleagues and friends. But I thought that this could be done in a much better way. And in robotics, uh, and also, I guess, also in other fields, we need lots and lots of images of real-world environments um, and uh, to develop robust algorithms. And uh, we sort of uh, guess these type of environments, usually. So we collect our own data sets, and then uh, we run, we develop our algorithms for those, and then we tweak it for a while, and then it works for that data set. But we don't actually have a lot of data from very different uh, environments and so on. Um, so the, the question came with this is that, can, can I make this uh, data collection process much at a much higher scale, much more scale, but like bigger scale? and make it easy for people to do this. And uh, the, one of the things that I, like I asked was that if we were to ship robots today, 
like two homes and so on, what would they see? What would they, what's the data set of that? What would they come up with? And no one sort of knows this because, yeah, people actually are, as I said, building mock environments in their uh, labs. My lab is also doing that. So we are building like a kitchen and, and a living room and so on. But I thought this is a bit, uh, uh, this is too much. This is uh, not realistic also and leads to optimistic performance evaluations. So uh, what can we do? Um, so the challenges here is that we can't, we can't really use Google Images or Flickr like we could for other tasks, at least here. Because 3D is important. We, we want 3D, not just for robots, but for, in, for different applications. And we might be also interested in a sequence of images. And those are not in Google Images or not in Flickr. Um, so how can we solve this? And th there are some uh, previous data sets. Um, some of them are mainly geared towards uh, object detection. So though there you have uh, the object isolated in a turntable. So that's a diff that data set is collected for a different purpose. And, uh, and most of them are in that, in that regard. Um, so our solution is that the Microsoft Kinect sensor is, uh, is revolutionized many uh, subfields in, in robotics and computer vision. And it, it is at the homes of 30 plus million people. And it's, it has been, it's the fastest selling consumer device. And uh, can, we, can we actually make it uh, that simple to collect data? For, so that uh, we can tap into this resource, basically. And what we came up with is, is a website, is a browser plugin that uh, works on, across all browsers. And uh, what you have to do is that you install this plugin and then you just go to the website and hit record and it starts uploading losslessly compressed uh, depth data to our servers, uh, both RGB and depth. And that's it. Uh, the next time you want to do this, you just go to the website. You don't have to like, launch this application or, or anything. And um, so, what driver do you ask? You assume use? so it works with all drivers, basically. Um, um, all drivers? Okay. So right now, it's, it uses uh, Kinect SDK from Microsoft. And it works with both uh, SDK or the redistributable for Kinect for Windows. I mean, Kinect for Xbox or Kinect for uh, uh, Windows. Um, but it also works with other, uh, other drivers and other, uh, yeah. So you consider using real robots? Because we have a couple of them. We have done this thing where we, we actually have real robots that we collect this data. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is nice, but I, it might be useful to say, OK, what does a real robot see and what a Exactly. So the, the the thing is that the, at the core of this is a C++ library that, uh, that is uh, decoupled from the browsers or anything like that. So you can actually, and that has few dependencies. So you can actually get that and embed it into your application and it exposes only three functions, start, uh, like set the server name, record and stop. And it does all the processing, all the compression and buffering, everything that it has to do talking to the server and so on. And so it's actually quite easy, easy to use just to grab that and compile it and sort of, uh, and then, yeah, exactly. That's what, that was one of the things that I also thought. For example, you are running your experiments and you want to record your experiments or you are running this robot, uh, you programmed it so that it come, goes up and down in the corridor three times a day uh, and you want to record that for some reason. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not only a browser plugin, but that's just the front end of it, so that it's easy to use. Because we, I didn't want to make people compile things. Like, no one will, will do that, of course. Have you considered programming this for the Roomba? Programming this for the Roomba? Uh, you mean, like a... Uh, no, does the Roomba has... Has an API. Ah, okay. I didn't know, I don't, uh, I didn't know this. Yes, definitely. As I said, it's a, it's a C++ library that is on GitHub. Uh, you just pull that and hit make, and that's it. Um, yeah. You need a Wi-Fi and all these network accesses. Exactly. So that, that, this is, that, that, that was actually the most challenging part, because as soon as you start this, 
uh, I'm going to show you a video. Uh, as soon as you start this, it starts generating gigabytes of data. And uh, you don't want to do that in somebody else's computer. So the most time that we spent on this was uh, compress the data in a lossless way. And uh, because it, it also needs to be uh, uploaded to our servers. And if it's gigabytes of upload time, that's, that's going to be a lot. So the, the, our target goal specification with this was that when you hit the stop recording, the data should be uploaded. It should be sort of real time. It should be streaming as you, as you record so that it's almost, there's no cost in that regard. Um, I'm going to uh, now show you a video. Um, so this is the website. If I could, it's at connectathome.com. You can go there. I don't have the internet, but it should be on. It should be running. So what you do here is that uh, you come here, you, you click, and you learn why this is useful and so on. Uh, get ready. And then you can install. Uh, the plugin is like two, two megabytes, so that's super small. And then you need to install the drivers, depending on what kind of device that you have. And once you do that, uh, you come to this recording page. I don't know if this will. Oh, anyways, so you come to this recording page where um, there's here there's, there's the record button that you don't see because this. Yeah, now it's more here. So once you hit that button, um, basically it uh, now it's recording and sending Kinect frames. Uh, uh, to our to our servers and uh, compressing it losslessly, buffering it, talking to the HTTP server that we have, and so on. And then you can record what whatever you want to do. Maybe you can do some gestures in front of the camera. You can show wherever you are and such things. So here I just take a look around my uh, my room. Um, no. Just the images. Uh, the, right now, we save the both images um, uh, and the calibration parameters if, if we can get them. Um, and then, when you hit stop, you are, you sort of come to this page if the upload is not completed, and you see that how much left uh, for you. And you can, if you type in your email address here, then you can access all your recordings. So if you, if you type in your email address, you, you can delete them, you can edit them, because it should be in your control, sort of. It's, we don't, I don't want sort of making people uh, uneasy about privacy. So you can, it's your own data. Um, but uh, yeah. So you are transferring depth as well, depth, all RGB. All, all of yes, all so it's both uh, depth and RGB. But the R hmm? You have timestamps, everything. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, it's recorded at 10 FPS. It could be more, but this I thought this is kind of OK. Um, you should probably expose that as a parameter. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That would be good. Um, and uh, the, the RGB is compressed with X264 codec. And the depth is compressed with uh, a, a variation of the FFV1, which is uh, lossless. So the depth is yeah. How much compression do you get? Um, so, so this is as you saw here. For example, this this was like 21 megabytes, and uh, that's um, that's for a recording of uh, about uh, one and a half two minutes, something like that. Um, the depth compression is is about one and a half times more than the RGB. So whatever you have for the RGB, it will be one and a half time more than that uh, for depth and yeah. And we are not putting tags because I would assume like somebody if they create I, I create one or I want to create one you can yeah here so yeah just the title of tags I and mean, tags would be more because that's true I can just make this just, uh, yeah. change the website so that this says tags yeah but you can type in any free text uh, there but yes that tags would be so I actually do that here so if you give your email address. Then you can type, this is my office. Uh, and then you hit save, and that's it. Now we have these, uh, the, the images in, in our servers. Um, What's the resolution of the depth? Uh, 64 by 48. Both. Mm -hmm. 
640 by 48. 48. 480. <laughs> that would be quite small. But, it, but it's native, it's lossless compression. It's yes, exactly. So the depth is. Depth is compressed lossless. But in your previous talk, you mentioned the depths could be used as a coarse guidance, right? Mm -hmm. True. Exactly. I, I agree with that. Um, yes, definitely. You can uh, record it in a much higher, smaller. But then, how do you do the alignment? Because uh, with the Connect SDK, for example, we don't get, uh, we cannot get the uh, calibration parameters. So how do you actually go from half of RGB for as a for a depth map, and then? You can, I mean, I understand the upscaling it, but then how do you project it back into the color space, that image? So for that reason, I thought, okay, let's let's take the best thing. Let's yeah, sort that of. That can be done, but I, actually, there is a lot of advantage of having the full resolution. Mm. We found out by doing robotics things that if uh, we have sure. full resolution, it's much more. Sure, exactly. So if if your application can deal with uh, lower resolution, you can always downscale it, but, uh, yeah. So what, these are two separate projects that you were describing. Mm -hmm. right? so, so this is a more general case. Sure. The data sets can yes. for any sort of thing. It's not necessarily just the previous project. No, no, no. So this came, as I said, after this painful uh, sequence of collecting data. I thought, can this be made better? This, this sensor, okay, every robot has five Kinects on them or every system nowadays, but it's also at the homes of 30 million people or so. So can we make this uh, that simple to, to collect data for us? And the most simplest thing I thought was to uh, just go open, go to a web page. Because that's... So right now we have, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't check the last uh, numbers, uh, but uh, last time uh, that I checked we had 39 uh, homes. Recorded so 39 from 39 different places. Yes, sure, sure. The, so the data I'm going to talk about those as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oops. Yeah, and this is the like recovered depth from the server, um, the, the the depth video of that recording. Oh no, it's it's a bit looks more black. But it's reconstructed. It's recovered losslessly. That's the point from that. Um, oh yeah, here, here it is. So, um, some, so right now it's in stealth mode, so I didn't sort of tell anyone. It's, it's there, but I didn't tell anyone, because if now everyone rushes there and the server crashes, I wanted to be at Stockholm for that, um, um, to, to fix it. Uh, and it will crash probably. But, uh, so we have captured homes uh, so far from 39 places, and um, this is, as I said, by directly contacting some amount of people here, but not telling them what to do. So just go to this website and see if you can make it work. That's it. And the average recording was 3.2 uh, minutes. It is approximately 2,000 frames, images. And it's typically living rooms, kitchens, or offices. Uh, more living rooms than kitchens, because the, the device is sort of is at people's living rooms, so, and you can't really take it to other places. Um, and the participants were from United States, Germany, Sweden, and Japan. Um, so the, the thing is that, for example, it's in Sweden and Germany, it, it is real time, as I said. So as soon as you hit stop, it, the data is uploaded, so you don't wait. And if you were not doing compression, or, or some worse compression that we tried lots of different things, it, it would take hours and hours of upload time if, if you don't do that. And that's not going to be tractable at all. So we wanted to have that so that it's easy. Um, so who owns the data? Privacy, that uh, was asked before. So um, the, all the data will be publicly available for, the, for research, of course, uh, purposes um, for all the researchers. And um, it is, uh, it's being considered to be licensed as, as a 
open database license, which basically tells that you can use it for whatever you want, uh, unless you should you give credit. You should say that uh, this was taken from this place, or you should cite it. Um, and as I said, if you give an email address in the end, you, we send you a password, and with that you can log in and see all your recordings and download them and so on, uh, or delete them. Yes, that's the next slide. Oh, okay. yes. um, or maybe the one after this. Um, so one of the things that people came up, asking user incentive, like why should people do this? Why should they just, why just, I mean, helping robots is cool, but, or research. But one thing that can be done that I'm working right now on, uh, or when I will, go, I will continue working, is giving a 3D reconstruction uh, of the recording back to people. So you'll be able to say, for example, record your living room, and then our server will go back and um, process this data, make a 3D reconstruction, and then you will get an email saying that, oh, your, your uh, map or your virtual world is ready. You can go and check it out um, uh, when you log in. Um, so, yes, so the current work is on is at an easy annotation system where you'll be able to go, it's still web-based, so that it's easy, so that you can, will be able to go to connect at home slash annotations, and then you will see um, images that you can draw bounding boxes or label whole sequences and things like that. And the idea is that then researchers will be able to make queries like this to the server. So give me 5,000 images of cups from 30 different homes, for example, this kind of. I'm assuming that you're taking the RGB and not the depth. Three, yes, right? exactly. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that it can be really used for is to automate this process where the robot moves around, it takes this stream of data, sends it back, and then you process it, and you say, oh, these are the things which I have the points for, and then these are the missing things, so go ahead and like capture it. Mm. The robot can position itself back and like, capture mm. more so that it evolves. I mean, you can even imagine like what after robot where it just like flies around and takes like at any height mm. and gets a uh, few all the information. So because I mean we are manufacturing such robots research. So mm -hmm. we are we are very interested in using this and making it more loop wise where instead of just being it like you record it across, it would be like okay, a robot autonomously records something, sends it and then it gets more information as oh these are the missing pieces and go and explore further. So it would be like that. It can keep on evolving, especially if the robot is autonomous and has a battery attached, yeah. which we have. Yeah. So I think that would be something. And the other thing is, what's the limit on database? So I, I can quickly think of this getting completely uh, full. Of you mean storage? storage. Yeah, storage. Yes. So we we got a powerful server. But it's uh, on a research budget, so it's uh, that's one of the reasons why I want to be at Stockholm when this is completely released. Um, but the, right now we have about uh, uh, 12 terabytes of uh, storage, and each recording, as I said, takes um, at most about uh, 100 megabytes. So that's a lot of recordings until that's like a couple of thousands of recordings uh, until. Uh, but of course, it depends on your. Uh, I mean, if you leave it open for a day, uh, of course, that, that would be quite a lot of data. But since it's doing compression as well, if the scene is not changing, the, uh, the amount of data transmitted should be considerably lower. It's, if you just set it up and direct it to a static scene, you are basically not sending anything, basically. Or you are just sending the noise. Uh, because it's doing delta encoding and so on, which I didn't talk about. Yeah. It's interesting to see how much there is required to get the data for an entire home, right? Because that's essentially your thing. If yeah. you're saying, oh, you want it to go to 1,000 homes, yeah. for each home you want to get the complete picture, yeah. then this is the data. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That would be interesting. But as I said, it's uh, on average right now, you have like three minutes of recording time. If you are walking around with that, maybe it's five minutes or so. So it's not, it's not a... Okay, uh, as I said, future work will be about uh, giving user back incentive like a, a 3D reconstruction uh, back and display it on the browser using WebGL uh, so that you will be able to just fly through your living room after, so that, that would improve people's recordings and the quality of 
recordings, and that's good for research, I think. People will, will clean up their, their room stuff. So, <laughs> so, 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 so you will so, not find a realistic uh, uh, representation of the house. Well, why would you clean the room? Because they want to see it in polite when it's recorded online. <laughs> well, I would, well I would like the recordings are private. <laughs> I mean, the, so the reconstructions and so on, it's not like we, it's not shared with, the, I mean, it's, you can see them. The, da the annotated data, of course, will be available for uh, research, as I said. So that's not, but we don't collect any, uh, like, it's completely anonymous. So we don't, any, any personal data is, is totally. Basically, given the sequence, you don't know who contributed. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have a user name associated with that sequence, right? Uh, if they give a username, we, we know they're, uh, email addresses, as I said. But I mean, like, uh, as a user, you, your system wouldn't know, but uh, other people who handle the data ah. wouldn't know. Right? No, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't know who exactly, I mean, yeah, they, they wouldn't know their names or, yeah. or Facebook uh, pages or things like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so let's, uh, so the next thing is to, to be able to show this in and here is an example of that, for example. You have this 3D reconstructed person and it's on, in the browser. Uh, it's displayed in the browser so you can rotate it and see it and fly through your living room and so on. Okay, so that that's, uh, concludes also this part. Yeah. You captured gyro, accelerometer, that kind of data if it is available. For example, if somebody is moving around in an iPad, if you have this kind of information, then you can reconstruct much better if you have like the dinosaur. So, whenever possible, if you actually connected that in transmission as well, that might improve your... From iPad? From iPad or any, any device, even though sure. you have that, any device which has this information of gyroscope. Because now you, oh, don't, you, don't, need, okay. yeah, you don't need to like estimate the motion, you already get like the sure, motion sure. information. Sure, yes, um, exactly. The, so right now, the, the library doesn't take other sensory modalities. It's only taking images and so on. But it would be quite easy to say if you, if you have IMUs, gyroscope or accelerometer and these kind of things, it would be easy to transmit those frame by frame as well. Can I give you an estimation of where the floor plane is? So you oh. can, you can, or where the floor plane is in mm -hmm. your picture so you can detect what your inclination is. The, the yes, exactly. If it's living room, yeah, exactly. Where, what the plane, uh, if it's indoor environments, and yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. So usually, I guess when people uh, uh, capture, you capture the data, you should tell no other people around the room. So I guess mm -hmm. the footage is to capture people. You probably there's no people, no people in the room. Right? Uh, there are some. There were some people. Yeah, yeah, in offices, for example. And one th one recording comes to my mind. I have a video of it. I can show the video of it, but. Uh, from Germany, for example, one person that recorded their uh, work environments, uh, environment. It's like an off open office space where people, some people are working, some people are walking around, and he's sort of showing it. Uh, yeah, that could have some privacy issues there. Like at home, if you capture your, your family members, I mean, sometimes it may, not be, it may not be desirable. Sure, they, they agree. I mean, there's the contributor license as well. But, but the person which is being recorded, you yeah. don't have their agreement to share that. But that's, you don't have so to should, do that anyway. Yes, then. yes, yes. I mean, if, yes, if, if you're sharing, I don't think you, you need to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. If you're sharing with us, you should, right? Just for that. No. Because I mean, if you take you outside in the street, you, you take an image of the Microsoft headquarters and someone is passing and you put it on your blog, can that person? You should, uh, you, should uh, uh, you know, cancel out that person because you don't have that person agreement for you to show their images. Okay. <laughs> this, this is different places have different rules. There's, sure. a, reason, there's a reason why Google Maps yeah, That's true. That, that that I agree with that. For example, in Germany, you have to do, the, there's this whole controversy yeah, so on. You should do the same with your data if you share, show it to anybody. That's true. Even, uh, even to see them yourself in theory, but. Yeah, you know. I can, uh, yeah, but that, that's interesting. Uh, I can add uh, like a. <laughs> another close there. So there is there is such a thing. I mean, because this is not the only sort of crowdsourced data set in the world. The people have done such things and they face these problems. So they come up with contributor licenses and so on. That hope covers this, but now I'll read it more carefully. So yeah. have you thought about allowing users to annotate some of this data well? I and mean, it's like face tagging, right? So similarly, they'll just like draw something on any 
object that they see and then take, oh, this is a car, this is this. So that would really help oh. in your uh, um. automated uh, object recognition if you actually allow. Yeah, uh, that uh, once they crowdsource it from other, like some people could just be, I mean, even if they don't contribute, they can just go and look at the existing things and start annotating stuff. It can be, yes, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, because it's, uh, yeah. So I'm going to actually talk about this fast then. Um, so here, the, this, this project is about the, one of the, the other thing that I talked about, meaning how does the robot know that in more in, indoor environments, for example, are configured the way they are, that corridors leads to more rooms and there's probably one kitchen and there's probably not 10 kitchens, and, but there can be 10 offices. And so on. How does how does the robot or any system can know this? And previously, this has been done. Um, it's it's hand coded usually. Basically, there is no sort of you you put you input this into the system. And uh, this was one of the, one of this was also true for the first video that I showed. And I wanted to solve this. Like how how can I uh, come up with something that fix, that alleviates this at least to some extent? And um, and the point is that we are building methods and algorithms and also robots to operate in mostly indoors um, or at least most of the time uh, some of the time and um, but we don't know actually we don't know how indoor environments look like this is not very well understood again and uh, and the one one uh, uh, clue uh, one application that I'm considering here is that again as I said reasoning about the unexplored space so uh, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that given part of a building floor, part of a building, can we predict the rest accurately? Or can we predict the rest to begin with? Can we, can we know that, well, I've seen a kitchen, there won't be probably another kitchen, or there's probably some bathrooms here or so, or uh, offices. For example, when I first, today when I came to Microsoft Research, I knew sort of some idea of there will be offices, there will be a cafeteria somewhere and so on. Um, so what do we need? We would need lots of lots of annotated floor plans and buildings and so on. And again, this is a big, big logistics problem because you need to, if you want to build such a uh, data set, you need to actually go to these buildings one by one, measure each room, annotate, put it into the computer. This is an office. This is and so on. Oh, oops, I clicked it. And you can't really, uh, again, you can't really type this into Google Images or Flickr and get that. So then I started looking, like, how can I get this type of data and so on. And uh, it turns out that I found the, uh, uh, the MIT campus data set, which was mostly done for maintenance purposes, so to maintain their uh, buildings and so on. And this, was, this, was, this is actually a master thesis of an architecture from the architectural department, where they, um, they, the annotation there is that uh, there is uh, close to 200 buildings, um, 940 floors, and 38,000 real-world rooms in this data set. And I also collect, cons collected or made my own data set K from KTH buildings to sort of to give something back and compare, basically. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by data set here? What does the data set contain? So. The data set is floor by floor, and each floor contains rooms, navigability between the rooms, meaning in topology, and the room label, a 2D layout of it, and some extra properties in the KTH data set that I put more, like number of windows and so on. Um, but the, the two are sort of have the same format. Um, so an example, uh, an example floor plan. So this is an example building from an MIT. I think this is from an MIT building, where you can see like there's a corridor, offices, elevators, uh, a conference room, a classroom, and so on. And uh, it's, it's a lot of rich data here to be, to be exploited or to be uh, learned. Um, and this is its topological representation, where topological graph. Now this is a topological graph where you can see this type of... Uh, yeah, each, each sort of circle is, is a room here. And if you want to look at it in more detail, where you, you can see that it, there's a corridor and then there's some offices, stairs, ele uh, some uh, elevator or electricity and so on and so forth. So um, I'm going to skip, like, go fast now because we, 
there was a lot of discussion. But uh, so the the point here, the, the aim of this goal, as I said, giving a partial floor plan, can we predict the rest in the topology now? This is, um, and um, each topological uh, map is actually an undirected graph. And that's the nice thing about this, is that uh, we already have a graph structure here. So usually you sort of convert your data set into a graph. You pick out random variables from it and try to sort of find uh, conditional dependencies and, uh, and so on. But here we, we have a graph uh, and each sort of node there has some properties, area, label, and so on. Um, and some preliminaries, let, let, let that partial floor plan graph uh, G and we have a graph database D and let we say that uh, the projected database of G on D is all the graphs that are in D that contains G. In, in an intuitive way if, if you are given a partial graph that has a corridor in an office DG will be all the floor plans that has a corridor in an office connected to it. That's simple, very simple. Uh, and um, and here we define that an edit operation on this graph is either a node or a vertex addition. So it's either you add a new room or a new connection in between the existing rooms. And then we can pose the question is, what's the probability distribution over all possible edit operations given a, a partial, uh, partial floor plan graph? So I'm going to, again, go fast. Um, so first, what to try is that just count base. So what, what I tried first is that let's just count, given a partial floor plan, partial graph, let's just count the most frequent thing that happened to it. That's like the simplest thing in our database. And here are the results for that. So by result, what do I mean? I mean that we make a prediction. We say that, oh, there will be a, a type of this room, for example, or uh, there will be another office or, or so. And then we go and check that in the ground truth does that exist or not? And if it, if it exists, it's one point for us. So the takeaway from this graph is that this method, um, as you can see, for, as the, for growing graph sizes, input initial graph sizes, so uh, the performance drops very sharply. What this means is that, say, I give the, the system a, a floor plan graph of 10 rooms, for example. And then I predict, I ask it to predict, will there be a next, like what's the next likely thing to happen here? Say that I have a robot in this, in this environment. And then it predicts something. And you can see that it drops really fast for, for bigger, uh, as the graph complexity sort of grows. Yeah. Just to understand what I um, you got like a subgraph of an actual graph that's in database. Yeah. And then try to add one edge, so say, say hey, I'm going to attach a new office to the corridor. That can be, a, yeah. For example, yeah. and then you check if that's valid or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's one way of evaluating. There can be other ways. Um, but, yeah. I'm trying to figure out what's the plot. The plot is for growing sizes of the input graph. So for growing graph complexity. Even. So you have, for example, an input graph that contains eight rooms in it. You do this prediction, and then you check if it's true or not. So as your graph, because it's, it's easier to do this when you have just one or two rooms. I mean, that's, that's like, that would be, you don't have many choices there. Um, right? So, so you mean like you predict like eight uh, rooms, or, or you give eight rooms predictable? No, yes. given eight rooms. Given eight rooms, you know, you know that eight rooms, the type of eight rooms. Exactly. Say that the robot has explored eight, eight rooms, rooms already. No, that is another room. Exactly. This, the scenario here, you can think of the first video that I showed. For example, the robot is looking for complex boxes or some, some object, and it's, it explores. It starts exploring. It finds a room here, a room there, a room here, office, office, office. And then we are trying to ask the system, OK, what's the probability of finding a kitchen? or finding another office, or finding a, a restroom, or something like that. Probably of what can I add that would be correct? Uh, I mean, I given all the things that you can I guess add. what surprised me is that if you give me a graph of 10, yeah. I would guess the most likely thing is another office attached to the corridor, and so that's probably right at least 80% of the time. No, <laughs> that's, that, uh, it might not be. 
Uh, it depends because I'm going to explain those things as well in a sort of uh, fuzz. So the point with this is that since this method just matches whole graphs to databases, to the, to the graphs in the database, uh, as the uh, size of the graph grows, you have less and less examples in the database to match to, right? Or if you have in a more realistic case, for example, the robot or the system has, has an unknown category or some weird category. For example, one of the categories that we have here uh, was surgery room. So that's like happens only in two places. And if you have that in your input graph, this method would only try to find these graphs that also has the surgery room. So then you will sort of trap yourself into that part of the search space and never get out of that. So um, as I said, this is uh, it takes whole graphs into account, so this is like a not good. And uh, can we do better? Well, we can argue that indoor environments are actually organized in smaller functional subparts, functional subparts. So what do I mean by that is that indoor environments, we can posit that, are configured such that, well, whenever you have like an office and a corridor, you will have a kitchen, and then we will have restrooms as well, because the people need to go to there as well. And then you will have uh, a conference room whenever you have more than five offices because people will have meetings and so on. So there are these structure in the data that we should take care, we should take into account in, in local structure. And do we observe this in the data? So first what I did is that I looked at the graph theory literature and tried to sort of uh, do some uh, like analysis of what, what do they use for analyzing these big graph data sets like social networks and these kind of things, internet, and try to use the same kind of analysis to see if there's structure. And one of the interesting things here, for example, is the characteristic path length of, of indoor environments. What this means, what this shows is that given any random two room in the, in the building, how, ma how many other rooms you have to visit from, to go from one, one to other, to the other. So how many hops does it take from between two on average? And uh, this hasn't been looked at before at this scale. And you can see that, for example, for building, for when you have like 50 rooms, it takes about uh, two or two and a half rooms to, to, to go from anywhere to anywhere to, to travel in terms of travel time. Uh, hmm? What's half a room? Oh, this, these are average values. So, it's, yeah. So, um, uh, and you can see that the, the line here is sort of linear and it's very gradual slope. So, th that's like a very good. Um, evidence of a uh, structure, a strong structure that things are connected. Um, I looked into some other, other properties as well, but I'm going to skip those because it's, it's late. Um, one, one interesting thing that I looked into is the scale freeness, where they computed this for, say, uh, social networks uh, and so on, internet. And what this says is that uh, what is the probability of, a, of any room having k doors or k connections to other rooms. And if you plot this in the log, log, log scale, um, uh, you, most natural uh, graphs, most natural uh, graph networks, I should say, have this uh, power tail uh, distribution. So it, it, like, it follows some, some distribution that is here. And I computed that uh, for indoor environments as well. And com in compared to, for example, the internet or the U.S. power grid, it's 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 comparatively close to those things. So there there are like same efficiency concerns when you design electric grid and when you design uh, buildings because in one you need to, you want to take electricity as as fast as possible or as easy as possible from one grid to another and. In buildings, you, you want people to move from one place to another as easy as possible. So it was interesting to see these kind of same properties emerging from indoor environments that hasn't been looked before. And this is like a histogram of um, uh, room categories in both data sets, so at the KTH data set and MIT data set. And you can see some uh, interesting, uh, there is a lot of uh, similarities and also cultural differences. You can see that. For example, at the KTH data set, we have way more toilets than, than the MIT because um, actually I, I was surprised at this and when I checked it, it turns out that, that in Sweden we have uh, each, we don't have like stalls in toilets. Like each stall is, is a different room 
it's, it's more of a privacy issue, I guess. It's, uh, yeah, so each one of those co counts as, as a separate uh, sort of room. Whereas here you, you enter and you have like 10, 10 stalls next to each other or something. Um, so those are, there are these differences. And one of the, yeah. So the discussion is that um, here that we have checked these very large indoor um, uh, databases of real world environments. And we have seen that there is certainly there's structure and we have like tried a method that doesn't use this and it, it fails as expectedly. And now we have come up with a different uh, solution algorithm that takes care of this local structure. I'm not going to sort of explain the details of this, but intuitively I can explain that what this algorithm now does is that um, it tries to identify frequently occurring subparts of a given input graph. So imagine that you have given a, a, an input graph of 15 rooms or so. The first method would try to match that whole. This, this, now what we are doing is that we are trying to identify those, the parts of that input graph that uh, occurs the most or occurs frequently and sort of capitalize on that, exploit those parts only. So I don't care now if you have a surgery room in your graph. I won't, I won't bother myself with that. But I see that there, here there's a office office corridor bit here. And I know, I know that whenever that happens, there is also a toilet. So I'm just going to add, add that there and only grow those parts of the environment. So um, yeah, so we can discuss this about this more. If we so here are the results uh, now. Um, so here, um, the, the dash lines are the method one. So you can see that they are, they, as the graph sizes grow, they, they drop quite fast. Now the, the, no, sorry, the solid lines are, is the method one. The dash lines are method two. And uh, for training and testing on, on two, on, on the same data set, um, yields comparable results. So here, blue is the MIT data set. Red is the KTH data set. And when you train on the MIT data set and test on the MIT data set, and you do that also for KTH, you have like a similar, similar performance uh, thing. One thing to observe is that, of course, there's a huge difference between method two and method one, because as the graph size grow, method two sort of is not exactly, but almost invariant to this uh, growth in the global scale because it's making use of the local structures. So it's, it's steady after a while as the, as the graph size grows. The, the interesting thing that I wanted to try is how actually is transferable uh, models of indoor environments between different parts of the world. Like we train on the MIT dataset and test on the KTH dataset. How, because people always talk about these things like it's, it's common structure everywhere happening, but no one really looked at, at it at this scale, at least. And I wanted to do that. And um, here, the black line here now is the training on the MIT data set. So the model trains on the categories and the, and the floor plans that are in the MIT data set. And we are testing it on the KTH data set. And you can see that there's, there's some uh, performance hit from that, definitely. But uh, it's still doing much better than uh, the method one results. So there is certainly some structure that is being carried in um, even in very different places in the world when it comes to indoor environments. Of course, this, it must be mentioned that these are just the, uh, say, office uh, domain. So these are campus, so it's not homes or so. But um, yeah, so the, the annotation, so one of the future works is to also extend this to homes because you can crawl these floor plans at a very large scale from websites and so on. And I, I've, in order to make the KTH data set, I made an annotation tool to easily extract this type of data from, uh, so construct this data set. Uh, so conclusion, we have shown that indoor environments, first of all, are, we have qu quantitatively shown that are strongly structured and in, in exactly what senses they are structured at the very large scale. And we can argue now more strongly that uh, indoor buildings and so on are uh, uh, co composed of frequently occurring subparts. 
which has, uh, they are like, you can think of them like Lego bricks. Like you, you connect this and then you put this and then so on and you make a building like that. Uh, and we, we have taken a lot of discussions with the KTH's uh, architecture department while doing this because in a way we are sort of trying to get into the mind of people who designed buildings or reverse engineer those. So there are lots of rich data to be understood from, this is, ju we just scratched the surface. The data set has a lot of rich information that we haven't tapped into yet. We only looked at the, at the topology level right now. And future work includes, uh, uh, for example, uh, predict uh, labelings or categories from features like area and size and number of rooms and so on. So here, for example, it's a conditional random field um, uh, uh, modeling of, of, so this is like a full floor and each bubble here is a room and colors indicate the category of the room and depending on what kind of observations that you have we can test and, and see how, how accurate we are in labelings and another thing that I want to look at is the structured support vector machines where the output space is, is, is a structured space because that was one of the things that is uh, that was sort of counterintuitive when I started with this, uh, where what I tried to do is I tried to approach each floor plan graph as an image, as you would do, uh, and extract some features from it and fit some classifier to it and so on and so forth. But this is sort of using the wrong tool for the job because you are trying to um, convert a graph into a set of numbers, you, like, a, like a feature vector basically. Um, and that's assuming that your output space is, an, is a continuous and dimensional space, whereas it is not. It is, a, it is an actually a space of graphs. So, and, um, and you can, I think we can directly exploit this if we treat the output space as a structured space in itself. Um, yeah, so this is uh, feature work in this. Conclusion of the whole, uh, of the whole talk is that uh, there's lots of structure to be exploited in indoor environments that we haven't even looked into, like in this case, uh, yet alone uh, investigate how to model best. And um, it, it's clear that if, if, for example, in a search task or for some other tasks, if we want robust and efficient algorithms, we need to, we need to have this, uh, we can't just do blind search or full coverage based search and these kind of things. We need to exploit uh, this structure in scenes, both in scenes and at the very large scale in, in buildings. And yeah, data is good and I'm trying to, that, that was one of the common themes, getting lots of data of weird things and trying to come up uh, models for them. So that's, that concludes my talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Burning question, just a word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think. <laughs> you, you okay, okay, I have one. I agree, data is good, but you say you also talk to people from the architecture department. Yes. Can you try to a little bit hybrid in the case where your data is sufficient, sufficient to work? As you say, the product is getting more complex, maybe you can apply some design principles. Yes, exactly. Um, that, this is a great question because one of the things that uh, as soon as we have sit down with two professors from the architecture department, uh, they told us that, okay, you have this uh, architecture's handbook written by some German person, some olden times, Neufarts, uh, Neufarts or something, uh, where it's, it's literally a handbook for architecture where you tells you how long sh things should be and how wide, how many rooms and so on. But it's a book thick like this. And not every time, I mean, we can certainly take clues from that, um, I think, but it wouldn't be so um, applicable to just program that, in the whole book as a set of rules into the robot, right? So, uh, and for example, I'm pretty sure that the MIT buildings doesn't follow um, that, for example, or old buildings or new buildings. Um, or this building, for example. So the, I agree that the, you can go some way with actually checking how this thing was constructed in the first part, but 
here we are sort of uh, ignoring that handbook and try to come up with our own, come, try to reverse engineer that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.